Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Using Coaching Skills to Improve Office Management, brought to you by your Vanderbilt Alumni Association. I'm Sarah Whitney Anderson, Assistant Director of Alumni and Student Engagement, and I'm so glad you could join us from wherever you are this afternoon. Today's webinar will last around 45 minutes of time at the end for questions. Please feel free to type those questions as you have them in the box on the side panel of your screen throughout the presentation, and we will make sure these are addressed in some way before time is up. We will record today's webinar and post on the Expert Advice webpage in VU Connect, and we will share the recording with you via email. Many of you know our presenter today from previous alumni career offerings here at Vanderbilt, and I'm so excited she comes back with us every, uh, every spring. Here's her presentation. So Hallie Crawford, an alumna of Vanderbilt, is a certified career coach based in Atlanta, Georgia. Her company, HallieCrawford.com, and team of coaches have helped thousands of people nationwide uncover their dream career and make it a reality. Hallie is regularly featured as a career expert in the media, including Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, CNN, AJC, and Fox News. I'm so excited to turn this over now to Hallie. Thanks, Sarah Whitney. Greatly appreciate it. Um, I am so thrilled to be here with you all today, and we greatly appreciate your time over what may be um, most likely your lunch hour or thereabouts. So thank you for attending today. Um, we are going to be talking about leveraging and using coaching skills to improve office management. Um, and I apologize, everyone, today in advance. I've got a little bit of allergy stuff going on. I, we are based in Atlanta, and as many of you probably know or have heard, allergy season can be crazy here. So I do have some water, and things should be fine as we go. But just be patient with me if I need to clear my throat a little bit. So as Sarah Whitney said, we have been coaching and training for over 18 years. I know some of you might be thinking, um, you know, she sounds like she's 12. How is it possible that she's been coaching and training for that long? I'm actually 46. I absolutely love what I do. And I feel like um, what I do as a coach is, you know, my passion and my purpose in life, so to speak, which is wonderful. And one of the things that, you know, when I first started my coaching business a long time ago um, in my late 20s, I realized in my coaching classes or through taking the coaching courses I took from the Coaches Training Institute out in California I realized through the classes how impactful coaching skills could be, you know, but there's a difference obviously between doing it in the classroom and working with your peers there and then obviously working with clients in the real world, so to speak, and, and making those changes for them. And what we have found is, and this is one of the topics that's very near and dear to my heart, is what we have found is training um, professionals on coaching skills can help them with so many different issues um, in terms of office management. It can be working more effectively with coworkers. It can be dealing with a difficult employee. It can be helping inspire, motivate, or lead your team in a more effective way. There's just so many different ways that coaching skills can enhance your work performance and your brand as a professional. And these are the tools that I am gonna share, the tools that I am gonna share with you today, I should say, are ones that we use regularly with our clients um, when we're coaching them, but also the tools um, and coaching skills that we train them on as well um, in order to enhance um, their professional skills and you know, be more effective in their office and whatever culture, whatever issues are going on, okay? So let's take a look at our agenda. So here are the three things that we're gonna be talking about today. And we have a poll right out of the box here. So um, Sarah Whitney, if you can pull that up here in just a moment, I'm gonna do the quick intro for the agenda, that would be great. But what we're gonna talk about first, everyone, is just give you a very quick introduction to coaching and a quick definition so that you understand you know, foundationally where we're coming from and how we define coaching. Then we're going to talk about 10 critical coaching skills that will help you enhance your work performance and better manage, whether it's office politics, you know, within your organization, becoming a better leader, dealing with um, a difficult coworker, whatever's going on for you, these coaching skills will help with that. And then I will give you some suggested homework closer to the end. So we do want you to um, come away with action steps and action items that you will take in the next couple of weeks here. So Sarah, Whitney, if we have this poll in here, if you could go ahead and pull that up, that would be great. And we wanted to just find out in general, I know not all of the possible reasons why you guys are here are listed on here, but 
kind of in general, why you're interested in developing coaching skills. Is it because you're a new leader? Is it because you have difficult employees or maybe it's coworkers? Um, maybe it's because you want to take on more responsibility and become a more effective leader. Whatever's going on for you, if you could pick from this list of options. And if it's other, that's okay too. And Sarah, Whitney, if you do me a favor and read out the poll results, I always have trouble finding those on the screen. And my eyesight isn't as good, so I can't always see them anyway. <laughs> that would be great. I got you. So we're at 85% voting, and we have 26% new leader, 21% difficult employees, 42% want to take on more responsibility and become a leader, and 13% with other. Okay, good. So lots of um, budding or just the people that want to become a better leader um, sooner than later. That's fantastic. Okay, perfect. So please know, again, two things. Number one, the skills that we're going to talk about today will help you cover all of these bases. We will have Q&A at the end, as Sarah Whitney mentioned. Um, if for any reason we don't get to all of your questions, everyone, please feel free to email me. And you can use the admin um, at HallieCrawford.com email address on the screen right now. I will get that, and I'm happy to answer additional questions for your specific need as well. And also, if anyone would like a copy of the presentation, please feel free to email us at that same address as well. We'll get that to you. And any other tools and resources that we mentioned during the course of things today. Just wanted to offer that because I know that some people may feel like, oh my gosh, I have to frantically write, write everything down. And so that kind of gives you a breather there. So let's talk first about, you know, give a quick introduction to coaching and kind of how we define it. I'm not going to read this slide to you, but just to give you kind of a quick history of coaching, kind of an overview. In the 90s, when um, the United States went into a recession and there was a lot of corporate downsizing, obviously, a lot of people <clears throat> were stressed out, managers and employees alike, and they didn't have as much support. And there was a great need at that time for, okay, how can I get more done and um, maximizing um, people's time and effectiveness and efficiency. So coaching started to, you know, um, become more popular, if you will, at that point. Um, and then in 1992, um, Sir John Whitmore, who had just happened to be a motor racing champion, he published one of the first kind of coaching um, manuals or workbooks, I think would be the best way to call it. And then obviously, as a lot of us have probably heard of today, Stephen Covey and Tony Robbins have made coaching as a profession um, something that's more popular and well-known. One of the things that I have found is that um, executive coaching for has been around for a lot longer than what we would call just traditional career coaching. Um, and the great thing now is that coaching has kind of um, you know, trickle down into different levels of any organization, and a lot more people know about career coaching to help maximize their professional performance as well. One of the things that I wanted to share with you all, and let me just pull everything up on this slide here real quick, because that'll be a little bit easier. So <clears throat> the way that we define coaching um, from our perspective as career coaches um, for my company is that whether it's executive business or career performance coaching, however you want to think about it, you need to think about coaching as helping someone learn in order to improve their performance in some way, shape, or form. So it a lot of times is one-on-one, -on -one, but there are people that will, you know, conduct group coaching and workshops, et cetera, but a lot of times it is that one-on-one -on -one type of relationship and activity. And one of the critical things, though, to keep in mind is coaching at its truest form is not supposed to be about issuing instructions and telling someone what to do. It is supposed to be about helping people, showing them something, giving feedback, and explaining something or encouraging them and encouraging them to find their own answers. And this is something that's interesting because when I first um, took my coaching classes and became certified as a coach a long time ago, um, when I first started my business over 18 years ago, um, it was hard to not give people advice. We tend to want to do that all the time because we want to be helpful. Um, and sometimes because, understandably, we think we know the right answer, right? 
Um, <clears throat> and so at the very beginning of um, our coaching classes, they basically kind of tied our hands behind our back, so to speak, and said, you know, you can't give people advice at all. And so developing, just for everyone on the call today, developing that muscle of asking questions and inviting information or encouraging people to share information instead of always just giving advice or issuing instructions, that can be a hard muscle to develop, but it's something that we really want you to start working on because a lot of times when our clients have some touchy situation going on at work or something difficult and we ask them to kind of put their coach hat on and go in asking questions instead of making assumptions and telling, you know, issuing instructions or telling people, you know, what to do, it helps enormously because they get a lot more feedback and um, positive or constructive input. So let's take a look at this next slide, what coaching is and what it is not. It is a method to give guidance to clients or people at your workplace, your teammates, um, <clears throat> your boss, whatever is appropriate for your situation, okay? It's also supposed to um, empower people to find their own answers. Now, here's the deal with this one, everyone. Not everyone's going to know their own answer. So yes, there are going to be times when you have to give them the answer because you know, because you're in the position of being their boss or their mentor or whatever it is. So that's not always the case. But the overarching goal for coaching and what you want to try to move towards a little bit more is to empower other people to find their own answers versus just handing it to them all the time because they're not going to learn and grow unless they start to find their own answers. And what we have found um, with coaching our clients is that when our clients come up with or come to their own conclusions about things, that learning is much more powerful for them and long lasting because they've figured it out on their own and they're more confident as a result. So just keep this second one in mind, the second bullet point here, that you wanna to lean towards this more than you probably do now. You don't have to do it all the time. And of course, if, for example, you're in a time crunch and you need to just get something done, it's not the time to sit around asking questions, okay? But as much as you possibly can, try to develop that muscle. The third bullet point here on the slide is that coaching is not therapy. Coaches are not therapists, and we have to be very clear about that, where our certifications you know, and credentials lie, if you will. But in terms of being a coach, and obviously, I'm sure all of you can relate to this and, you know, at least one example or one shape or form that feelings do come up, even at work in a professional setting. Every once in a while, that's going to happen. So <clears throat> sometimes if you ask someone a question about how they're doing related to a project or something else, they may give you an emotional answer versus something that's just logical and practical like you might be expecting. So you do need to be prepared. Again, you're not a therapist and you don't have to be. But you do need to be prepared if you do go in, you know, to a situation asking probing questions a little bit more, that feelings may come up a little bit. So you've got to start to become more comfortable with that and just let people remember you don't have to fix their feelings or fix whatever situation is going on, depending on the, the scenario, of course. But a lot of times people just being able to express their emotions, again, in an appropriate way for a professional setting, a lot of times that just helps them feel better and they just need somebody to listen, okay? And then finally, the last bullet point here that coaching technically is not consulting because as we talked about before, it's not about just telling people what to do and giving them the answers. There are elements of both involved. So what we have found over doing this for a long time is that we are more consultants than we were at the beginning um, because we have expertise to share and we have a methodology and workbooks and materials for our clients. So there is an element of consulting um, and advising that can come into um, the formula here that we're talking about today. So this is again where if there is a situation where you just need to tell them what they need to be doing or you know the right answer, if you've asked them, you know, even if you've asked them the question and it's not quite right, there is going to be a time when you're going to have to go to that consulting piece. But keep in mind that you want to at least try to solicit that information or elicit it from them by asking questions and being open to input and feedback. Because again, as we said, that can be so much more powerful for the other person. Okay, so that is our first agenda item basic introduction to coaching to give you a sense of kind of where we're coming from with this. Now, let's take a look at our 10 critical coaching skills. So some of the foundational skills for coaching that we share with um, <clears throat> and coach our clients on 
are things like are on this list, how to create a safe space, a space where people trust each other, where we're transparent, you know, again, as much as reasonable within a professional setting, but there's that trust, you know, trusting each other, active and positive, listening, guiding, not advising, like we've already talked about, self-managing, not just going in when you're in an angry spot, you know, taking some time to blow off some steam before you go talk with some, someone about something that may be frustrating for you. How to leverage curiosity um, in your professional relationships versus telling people, you know, what to do all the time. Um, <clears throat> leveraging your intuition, forwarding their action and their learning. So trying to help others around you learn a little bit too and, you know, develop as professionals. Developing that empathy for others, recognizing their strengths and being able to develop your unique leadership strengths. So these are some of the foundational skills for coaching that we work with our clients on. So let's dive into um, some of these skills and let's talk about this first one here. So I'm gonna share with you some of the, like, the most foundational skills, okay? Um, that I would say are the ones that you need to develop first before you do any of the other things, okay? Because this is kind of the perspective that you need to take on the situations at work. So the first thing to think about is how do I create a safe, quote unquote, and courageous space? The reason why we say courageous is to, you know, enable people and encourage them to step out of their comfort zone, try something new, take a risk if they need to, so that they can grow professionally and your organization can do so as well. So we want you to think about, first of all, why and how. So first of all, you know, why would we want to do this, create this kind of space? Well, first, we want to have um, that openness and honesty and trust between coworkers. We need to at least have that to a certain extent for the office to run well. You need to trust that if you ask someone to do something or vice versa, it's going to get done and it's going to get done in the right way. So I want you to think about, first of all, what makes you willing to be open with someone in order to develop that greater trust and be more transparent and honest. And some of the things that we have found that we, um, suggest to you all is when you share and you are vulnerable in some way, you share your feeling about a project you're working on or a perspective or whatever it is, or if you're having a difficult time with something, that encourages other people to be vulnerable as well, okay? So that's one of the things that you can consider doing, okay? So here are some of the other things on the bottom here. If you take a look at the slide, the way that we have our clients begin to or enhance the kind of workplace and the culture that they are in with their team, with their employees, et cetera, is to structure your coworker, your relationships with your coworkers and your employees, and make sure that you have kind of guidelines and agreements in advance of a project that you're working on or in advance of um, working with them for the first time, okay? And by the way, if you've already been working with all, a lot of these people for a long time, it's okay. You can backtrack a little bit. Like you can still start from this place and start to set the stage and have guidelines and agreements about how to work together more effectively. You, it's okay if you've already been working with them for a long time. Here are some of the things that we suggest you all discuss in order to create that quote unquote safe space. You want to structure the relationship with them, the conversations that you have with them in the meetings. You want to talk about first confidentiality. If that is relevant for this project or your organization, if things need to be kept confidential, and if they do, what do we really need to keep confidential versus what is okay not to? If that's relevant, you want to discuss that and what you all agree to in terms of confidentiality. You want to explain to them too what your style is and find out what their style is for working. So explain your style, but ask them about theirs as well and find out what their strengths are in addition to sharing what your strengths are so that you can ensure that as you work together more effectively or as you work together, I should say, on a project, you can work together more effectively because you're both playing to each other's strengths, okay? Then you want to also let them know and ask them as well what their desires are, either as a leader within that project or within that team or, you know, whatever it is, like what kind of role do they want to play and do they, do they feel most comfortable playing within that team and within that project, okay? And as we said here with this next kind of sub-bullet point, as I said a moment ago, 
be vulnerable and open with them when it's appropriate. I worked with the CEO when I was coaching um, EMBA students out in Idaho um, several years ago, and he said, Hallie, everyone in my company is intimidated. He was a, he's a large man, you know, he's just a big guy. I think um, he used to be in the military. And he was explaining to me that, you know, he just, he has a strong voice, he has an opinion, he's a strong leader. And there are a lot of good traits about that, but he knew that people were intimidated by him. And one of the tools that he started to leverage more frequently was he would share in some of the, the team meetings, you know, and company-wide meetings even, um, with his staff, some of the, the fears that he had when he first started out as a salesperson to show them that he was human too, so to speak, okay? So it's okay and we encourage you to be vulnerable and open when it's appropriate and in the right way. But this can help people feel more trusting and have a stronger sense of being able to share um, as well so that you develop that trust between everyone more so. The third bullet point here is to establish your goals. OK, for the project, for the purpose of the team that you're working on, whatever it is, whatever it is you're working on right now, establish what your goals are. And when you go into any meeting that you have with anyone one on one or within a group, understand and be clear about, OK, what's our agenda and what's our goal? And make sure that you talk to them um, during the course of that meeting about anything that's come up for them. The other thing, by the way, that is not on um, <clears throat> the slide here that I did want to reference as well is talk with your group, for example, about how often do you need to meet? Um, what's the length of time that you should meet? How do you all want to handle conflict? How do you want to handle feedback and input? And come up with agreements for effective communication between the people in your group so that you have some pre-set up agreements so that when conflict arises, because inevitably it will, you know how you want to handle it, okay? And if you can establish all of these kind of guidelines in advance or even now going forward, it will help you all have a better work environment and manage all of your projects more effectively, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one or just a two-person team or a larger team, okay? And when you go into meetings, whether it's one-on-one -on -one with people or um, a larger group, if you take a look at the last bullet point here, make sure that you check in with people just briefly. How's everybody doing? Are there any challenges that we have that we need to address? Any concerns every, anyone has? Don't just launch into the meeting agenda. We always, with our clients, we check in with them first to kind of get a feel for where they're at, how they're feeling, how the past couple of weeks have been, because there may be some things that need to come to light related to your project that you all need to address and deal with. And part of this, as we said earlier, there could be some frustrations or feelings that you all need to address as a team to make things better, okay? Let's take a look at this next slide here. So still on creating a safe and courageous space. This kind of piggybacks on what we talked about before. Structure the relationships that you have at work more effectively. Don't just go into the project, you know, and just dive right in and get, you know, working. Talk about how you can work together effectively up front make those agreements. The other things that we want you to do, again, to piggyback on the slide before, is if you take a look at this slide, whenever you meet with someone, either one-on-one -on -one or in a group, we also want you as a coaching skill, and this goes back to the intuition and the listening that we referenced a few minutes ago, we want you also to do kind of a gut check of the energy in the room. How do people seem to be feeling? Too often, we just go into a meeting with, okay, here's our agenda, we're thinking, we're in our head, we're, you know, we've got to get a ton of stuff done in the meeting and we just launch right in. Take a few minutes to, it actually doesn't even have to be, I should say a few seconds, um, to see how the energy in the room feels. How do people seem to be feeling about what's going on? Um, and don't ignore that. If you have an intuition about someone is, you know, frustrated with something or having a difficult time, don't hesitate to bring that out either in the group meeting or one-on-one, -on -one, you know, whatever is, is you know, most relevant for that situation, okay? So be like, get into your body, so to speak, and be present and, you know, present enough and mindful enough to kind of get a feel for what's going on around you energy-wise that people may not be verbalizing. That's another really critical coaching skill. The second bullet point here is for those of you who um, may be having a difficulty with, um, an employee or a coworker, okay? 
And this actually goes you know, beyond that, but I'll explain here. So if you need to talk with someone about something that could be touchy for them, you need to give them some constructive criticism or some feedback that may be a little bit tough for them to hear. One of the coaching skills that we always recommend in this situation is to ask permission before sharing with them. So instead of just either avoiding it altogether, which would not enhance your professional relationships because things could just get worse, or just bulldozing right in and just blurting something out when it could hurt someone's feelings, pull them aside, have a separate meeting in a quiet location that's private, and ask them in advance or kind of give them a heads up. I have something I, I need to share with you that may come across as kind of tough or may be a little bit touchy. Um, is it okay, though, to share with you? Because I really need to explain this to you. It's something that I think could impact our project. So ask their permission. Nine times out of 10, they're going to say okay. But now they've got a heads up about what's coming, and they're not blindsided. And this will help you better manage your office and those relationships as well. I spoke with a client this morning who was telling me how her boss actually is now on a performance plan because he fired a few people in public at a coffee shop just out of the blue without any warning and has had other problems um, within their workplace. And he's the leader of the organization, so this can happen to anyone. Um, <clears throat> and this is something that they're recommending to him. He needs to obviously work on his bedside manner and asking permission or, you know, and kind of giving someone a heads up about something that's coming instead of blindsiding them is a great, very effective coaching skill to help them be less defensive about it. The third thing on the slide here is to remember, and we talked about this a little bit before, but when you're structuring your relationships and when you're interacting with people in your office um, on a regular basis, have your go-to kind of gut instinct um, action step be to ask questions versus making assumptions and diving right into things like we said before. So start out when you talk with anyone in the course of a meeting, especially at the very beginning, ask them some questions. How are things going? How are things going with this project? Like we said before, touch base with them on how things are going because that's your chance and opportunity to get that and gather that information from them, okay? One of the things that you wanna do is especially um, if you look at the next bullet point on the slide here, is especially if it's a new working relationship or a new employee that you have or a new coworker, you want to let them know that, you know, hey, I may, if, what if I need to give you feedback sometimes? Um, is that okay with you? And how do you want me to do that? Is it better that I send you something in writing to think about and then we can talk about it later, you know, in person? But have an agreement or come up with an agreement within your team, with your coworkers, with your employees about the best way that they can take and accept feedback so that you have an agreement about that up front, okay? And then, Sarah Whitney, if we could go ahead and jump to the poll here, that'd be great to give everyone a minute to um, fill this one out. What makes you most willing to be vulnerable or open with someone? Trust, empathy, or them being open with me. So we talked about this in the previous slide a little bit. Um, and then finally, one of the things you want to make sure in terms of office management, meetings, and work relationships, and people forget this one too often because they're in a rush at the end of a meeting, make sure that you review the action items and the goals that you all address during the course of that time so that everyone is crystal clear about who's in charge of what and what needs to happen next. This is an incredibly important, not just coaching skill, but leadership skill as well. Okay, Sarah Whitney, I'm ready when you are. Wonderful. So we have 79% with trust, 13% with empathy, and 8% them being open with me. Good. That's perfect. Thank you guys for sharing. So there may be other things, just keep in mind, that you all, um, there may be different ones from the trust, empathy, or them being open with me. But notice, like, so this is why we wanted you all to think about this for yourselves. Because if these are the things that you do for other people, they will be more willing to be open with you, give you constructive feedback, um, <clears throat> provide input when you need it, and anything else, okay? So let's talk about um, one of the second critical coaching skills. And I wanted to talk about this one especially. Um, 
out of the 10 that we mentioned um, at the beginning, we want to talk about a few of them. And this is one of the ones that is really critically important because a lot of people think that they're good listeners, but they're more like these little kids playing telephone and they're not as good of listeners as they think they are. Okay. So I always want to bring this up and listen, I was in this boat too, so don't feel bad. So let's talk about the three levels of listening from a coaching perspective. And the first one is level one. Level one is internal listening. It's basically listening to your own inner voice. It could be your opinion. It could be your judgment about something. It could be your needs. And these are some examples on the slide here. That sounds really hard. Gosh, I'm hungry. I need to go have lunch. Um, I don't want to listen to what this person is saying because they're driving me nuts. Whatever is going on, okay, that you're saying in your own head, this is our internal listening. We want our coworkers, and we say this with our, for our clients, we want our clients and coworkers to be in level one, not us, okay? So if you're taking on a coach-like perspective at your workplace for improved office management, you want to be a, you ha we have to be in internal listening in level one at some, in some way, shape, or form, of course. That's just part of being human. But as much as you possibly can be, you want to get out of your own head and be listening to other people more often into the level two listening, which we're going to talk about here in a second. So when you feel yourself dropping into level one listening, okay, it's understandable. You can make note of whatever that is, but then move back over to who you're talking to. It will help you be an enormously better leader as a result. Level two listening is what we call focus listening. It's focused on the other person. It's listening to each word that they're sharing with you, but also their nonverbals and, you know, the nuances of what they're saying, okay? And here's the deal with the focus listening. As I said a moment ago, leaders need to be at this level and then add level three as well. And we'll go into that one in just a second. So if you are ever finding, and I want to suggest you all, so today is um, Wednesday. For the rest of this week, start to notice how often especially in meetings, maybe we're in your board, how often you're going into this internal listening place and work towards getting to the focus listening, really listening to what other people are saying. And by the way, what they're not saying, what is their energy level and what's going on? This brings us to the third level of listening. I'll pull this up here just a second. Um, <clears throat> so that you can get a, try to get a sense of practicing, okay, well, what's really going on with that person that they're actually not saying? Or how does this person seem to feel based on their body language? So level three listening, which is what we want you to also add to your plate or your skill set, if you will, is this global listening. And this is the energy either between the two of you or within the group if it's a large team meeting. How is the energy changing? Is there sadness? Is there shifts in attitude? Is someone frustrated? Are they angry? Are they excited and love the project? Because let's say they're playing to their strengths. You need to notice that and ask them, "What are you really excited about this because it's like playing to your strengths? Great. Okay, well, what are those strengths that you think are being used? This is, again, going into that questioning mode. So you need to pay attention to the mood, the tone of the conversation, whether it's during the course of a large meeting or just two people, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, like we said before. You also can be paying attention to, by the way, everyone, kind of the ebbs and flows of the tone of your professional relationship working with this specific person or working with this group because the mood and the tone will change over time. That's just normal and natural. And the more you can pay attention to it and be in tune with um, in tune with it, the better able you're going to kind of be able to ride that wave a little bit and manage things effectively as a leader or with your coworkers um, so that you don't get caught off guard by, you know, something that someone says that if you had paid closer attention, you would have seen coming several weeks ago, for example. So how do we do this global listening? So this is what you would do for your homework assignment for the rest of this week is to just quiet yourself a little bit. Like if you're the type of person that tends to ramble maybe because you get nervous or you're more extroverted, let's say, and you just talk a lot, that's okay, nothing wrong with that. But sometimes take a moment to be quiet. Still your body and just be calm and slow down, even slow down um, the pace of the conversation a little bit. And when someone else is sharing something with you, even if it's about a task they're performing or data analysis or something, you know, practical and tangible and has nothing to do with feelings, don't step over everything, anything that they've said. 
because they may something like, okay, well, this didn't work out really well, but what I did was this. It's like, well, hold on a minute. What was that thing that you said didn't work out very well? Let's talk a little bit more about that. So slow them down as well if needed, okay? And Sarah Whitney, if we could do poll number three, that would be great to find out how many of you feel you have effective listening skills. That'd be awesome. So it's okay, everyone. We want you to slow yourselves down, but it's okay to slow them down a little bit too. And if you have set up your relationship effectively from the beginning, and you have to interrupt them sometimes, and you've talked about that, you know, hey, if I need to give you feedback, is that okay? It's okay if you need to interrupt them in some cases. Or you can say, oh, I'm really sorry, don't mean to interrupt you, but I need to ask you about this because you said it, and I feel like it's so important. Just paraphrase or, you know, give a quick intro. And then finally, as we said here, ask a question rather than giving advice. We talked about that a little bit earlier. These are ways, though, that you can get in touch with, so to speak, that global listening. Okay, Sarah Whitney, I'm ready. All right, so we've got 74% with yes and 26% with no. Okay, if you all are great at this, that is awesome. Please keep in mind the three levels that we talked about. This third level is something that's really, really important that will help you fine tune your listening skills even more. Um, that was not a pop quiz in terms of the poll, by the way. But we do have, um, there's a free tool online that we use with our clients that we f feel is, just, is very, very good. It's quick and easy, but it's the ask active empathic listening scale and we'd be happy to email that to you all if anyone wants that tool it's a really good test to get a sense of how effective are your listening skills and if there are a couple of little areas that you need to improve and kind of work on you'll find that out there and it'll give you some very specific action steps things that you can start to to work on and improve okay so feel free to reach out to us for that all right, so let's talk about our third critical core coaching skill, and this is the guiding, not advising. And I really like this one a lot. I'm going to pull up um, everything on the slide here, actually, okay? Um, <clears throat> so it's, I'm just going to give you a quick introduction, if you will, to what coaches call powerful questions. So powerful questions are open-ended questions. They are based in pure curiosity. They don't have judgment. They don't have an, a preconceived answer, or and there's no assumption within them. They're kind of childlike, okay? And they allow the employee that you have, the coworker, whoever it is, to kind of experiment with their own answer. Um, so powerful questions basically are open-ended. They're not yes or no, okay? And <clears throat> um, some of the examples would be, how can we work together more effectively? How can we approach this project um, in the best way? What will achieving our goals give us, okay? So one of the other things that you all can do that I highly recommend as well in terms of homework is to start practicing these powerful questions. They're open-ended. Remember, they're not yes or no. When we do these workshops with people, they tend to start their question and they realize kind of halfway through, oh my gosh, this is going to end up in yes or no, so I need to back it up. It's a really good tool to start asking these big open-ended questions. One of the things that I wanted to mention to you about the examples that I just gave you a second ago is look at how those questions assume that there's going to be a positive outcome and good answer, okay? They assume that things are going to work out okay, and that's part of why these powerful questions can be so effective. Step number four, or critical coaching skill, I should say, number four, is um, self-management and strong self-management. We don't want you to be like the guy um, from the movie at the bottom left of the slide here, okay? So the self-management comes in when you want to stay present with the other person, like we already talked about, not thinking about your own thinking all the time and being in levels two and three, and then also managing your emotions effectively. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. If you're frustrated about something or angry with someone, take a step back, let it simmer overnight, journal about it, talk with someone to get their advice or thoughts about how you should handle it, okay? But one of the very important things to handling um, office politics and just, you know, office management in general is this emotional intelligence. And we really like, by the way, Emotional Intelligence 2.0. It's an easy read to help you en enhance your emotional intelligence. 
we can't just be, you know, savvy and smart about the tasks that we need to perform at work in order to effectively manage our office env environment and be strong leaders. We have to have this high EI or emotional intelligence as well. Okay. Number five, we talked about curiosity a little bit already. Um, and we will go through the 10 today. The rest of them, everyone, we've kind of touched on a little bit. So I'm going to go through these last few just a little bit quicker than the other ones, okay? Um, but we talked about curiosity a little bit already. And one of the things that I want you to think about is, okay, just kind of walking around the office in a way, asking more childlike questions, if you will. That helps you um, articulate your questions or frame out your questions as powerful questions versus yes or no. As we said before, if you take a look at this slide here, offer your opinion when it's appropriate. Make a decision when you have to, absolutely. But always at least make an effort to understand someone else's perspective. They may not be right. And it doesn't mean that you have to take or adopt their perspective or take action based on what they have recommended, but at least make an effort to show that empathy and to understand their perspective. Because nine times out of 10, you're gonna learn something from doing that anyway, okay? Tip number six or coaching skill number six is to start to leverage your intuition more and regularly check in with it. Listen to what people are not saying and not telling you based on the energy that you've kind of experienced or felt uh, what's kind of going around the office. Share your intuition as long as it's non-judgmental and without attachment. It's okay to say, you know, I feel like there's you know, this isn't working exactly effectively. I'm not sure, you know, how to fix it. I'm not sure um, why that is, but I feel like we need to talk about it. It's okay to share your intuition and you need to start trusting it a little bit more. I think we get in our heads too much in a professional environment. And I understand that we need to do that in a lot of cases, but <clears throat> Um, we also need to listen to our gut instinct a little bit more too, because it has something to tell us, okay? Um, number seven, coaching skill number seven, is to make an effort, especially for those of you that talked about wanting to be a better um, leader, a more effective leader, is to help other people forward their action and their learning. So one of the coaching skills, obviously, that we use with clients all the time is, you know, is there a question they need to kind of ponder? Can you provide some accountability for them if they need some support, you know, on sticking with a specific action item? And remember, too, that it may be something that you need to suggest to them that's more of a soft skill they need to develop. Like maybe they need to better handle conflict or something else versus, oh, you have to go learn this new software. Okay. Um, just wanted to mention really quickly that if anyone needs additional um, advice about anything that we've talked about today, based on your specific unique situation, Situation. Happy to do a free career strategy session with you. Feel free to email us at admin at hallycrawford.com for the presentation tools or happy to chat with you for a few minutes complimentary to help you with your unique situation. Okay. Um, coaching skill number eight is empathy. And we touched on this a little bit already. Empathy is understanding another person's thoughts or feelings, what their perspective is. And you want to try to, as much as possible, as we said earlier, try to be empathetic for where your employees, your coworkers are coming from, especially if they're being difficult for some reason, because there may be something else going on with them that you just don't know what's happening. And if you ask them questions, try to put yourself in their shoes a little bit more, you'll be able to be a better leader and more effective because you'll be able to um, understand and speak to what their values are and their motivations are and maybe what some of their struggles are as well. Okay. I wanted to share this four needs of followers for a moment here. This is a great tool um, that the Gallup organization uses from their Strengths Finder, um, some of their books that they have. There are four basic needs of followers um, and these are the four, the trust, compassion, stability, and hope. These also go for anyone in your organization, for coworkers as well. So don't just think about this if you're a manager um, or wanting to become a better leader. This goes for people that you work with too. We all want to have this sense of the trust, compassion, stability, and hope within our workplace in some way, shape, or form. And I put this one right after the empathy because if something is going on with someone in your office environment and things aren't going well, is one of these pieces missing for them? And that's what's causing the difficulty. 
this will help you possibly troubleshoot what may be going on and how you can begin to fix it, okay? And tips number nine and 10, nine is to be really mindful of and recognize other people's strengths in addition to your own, okay? So in order to effectively manage your office environment um, and anyone that you, you know, work with, manage those relationships with others in your workplace, you want to start to get really, really good at not just understanding what your own strengths are and explaining them to people so that they understand where you're coming from. And also, they allow you to have a role in your team that's going to be effective for you, but also start to recognize what other strengths are, okay? The way that you know what your strengths are are on this slide here. This is, again, from the Strengths Finder in the Gallup organization. Success, when you, you leverage one, one of your strengths, you feel effective. Um, if you have kind of an instinct for something, that is a sign that you have that strength or strength in that area. When you feel like you're growing as a professional, that's a sign that you're leveraging one of your strengths. And after you've completed a task that touches on or uses one of your strengths, you usually will feel authentic and fulfilled. And this is the same case with others in your organization. So if you see them being excited, find out why and what that strength is, okay? Number 10, coaching skill number 10, is to make sure that over time, you also develop your own unique leadership style, which will be a balance of these things on this slide, your strengths, your soft skills, your values as a professional, as well as your personality type, okay, whether you're introverted or extroverted, big picture or detailed, okay, and the way to think about and begin to enhance and develop your leadership style um, more so over time, we recommend using, this is from Development Dimensions International, it's a leadership wheel, these are the top 10 leadership skills that they say are the most important um, in the workplace today. Rate yourself on each of these areas, and we also suggest to you, by the way, that you have your coworkers and even your supervisor, if you will take that risk, um, have them fill it out for you as well, so that you've got the self-assessment as well as objective feedback from others, too. So these are our 10 coaching skills. I know this was a lot that we threw at you today. So what I want you to do, everyone, is to take a moment now. Um, we can actually move into the Q&A, so feel free to start asking your questions, because I'm just a couple minutes over time here. I want to make sure we get to those questions. Here are some sample action steps. Get out your pen and paper for us, if you would, please. These are some um, suggested action steps that we would have. Fill out the leadership wheel. Complete the listening scale. I always put these down there because I like little quizzes like this. I always like to fill out surveys. Sign up for the free career strategy session, if that would be relevant for your needs. Happy to talk with anyone about that if needed. All right, and let's go ahead and go to our Q&A portion of the presentation because I want to make sure we do that. Sarah Whitney, if you could just read them out for me, that would be fantastic. And while we're doing this, everybody, I'm just going to share with you, and I apologize, my allergies are kind of getting to me, but I wanted to share with you the quote that I love whenever I feel like I have to push the limits here a little bit and step outside my comfort zone, is the greatest risk in life is not taking one. So we're asking you to do this in order to practice leveraging your coaching skills. Okay, Sarah Whitney, I'm ready. All right. Our first question is, can you give an example of a childlike question? Yes, the child. that's a great question. So a childlike question is one that's just very curious. And actually, the, way, the best way to think about it is think of it as a powerful question, like we said. It's not yes or no. It doesn't assume an answer. And it's not just a, it wouldn't kind of force a yes or no answer. It's something that's very open-ended and they could answer in any way, shape or form. So that's the best way to describe it, I think. Good question. All right, our next question is, can you repeat the elements that make up your unique leadership style? Let's go back to those, hold on. Let me go back to that slide and I will pull it up. And remember to, if you would like um, the slides, don't hesitate to email us. So there are strengths, soft skills, values, and personality type. Good question. Keep going. Do we have any others, Sarah Whitney? 
I just yeah, keep talking because I get really excited about what I do. Okay, good. <laughs> You're doing great. You're doing great. So one other question was, how can you implement, implement this kind of coaching or situation with someone that may be above your pay grade? <clears throat> okay, so great question. And this is always something that's on my mind, too. Um, so just as a quick reminder, um, I'm going to put this slide up here so because it has the email on there. If for your specific, specific situation this doesn't fully answer, please feel free to email me and we can chat for a few minutes over the phone. But if someone is over your pay grade, yeah, it's not like you can go in, you know, like asking all these powerful questions. They're going to be like, what's going on with you? Um, <clears throat> so if that's the situation, think first about, okay, what do you want to comp accomplish from a conversation with them? What's going on? Um, that you need to ask them about. So is it about you're unclear about priorities and you need to have them prioritize things for you? So ask them that, you know, I'm kind of unclear about priorities. Can we go through these things a little bit more again? Um, if it's something that is touchy that you need to give them or you would like to, I should say, give them feedback on, it's going to depend on your relationship with them, obviously. Um, if you have a good, solid, trusting relationship and you feel comfortable enough going in and saying, I have something I want to share, but I'm really uncomfortable doing so. Um, I'm not sure, you know, if this is the right time. Can we talk about it? It, it? Again, it depends on the person in your relationship. I've had relationships like that with my bosses before where they told me point blank, give me feedback and tell me what's up. But I was still freaked out. It's still hard to do. I'm not saying that it's easy. But I was able to go in there and I would talk to them for a few minutes about, you know, something else. And I might frame it as, you know, I'm struggling with this. You know, can you explain this to me a little bit more? And then at that point, after you've kind of covered that, you could say to them, OK, I'm having trouble because I don't feel like I get that direction or guidance enough from you. Is there a way that we can work on that together or something like that? So make it more like a we. What can we do together about this and give them a specific example, like go in with a specific question that you have about something. And if there's a pattern of behavior that you would like to change within reason, that's where you can bring it up at that point and ask for what you need. And that would be the best way to do it. Keep in mind that, you know, we can't change people, um, not dramatically, at least. We can only change ourselves. If there's a really touchy and very bad situation with someone above your pay grade, that's when you may need to consider obviously going to HR um, and dealing with it um, in that, you know, kind of setting, if you will. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of, you know, food for thought. Wonderful. Well, and it looks like that is our last question. Um, so thank you all for coming and joining us this afternoon. And Hallie, thank you for sharing your wisdom and encouragement with us today. I know I took lots of bits and pieces and definitely feel calmer just by participating. Um, I just want to encourage you to, again, to check out all the career resources and events, both electronic and in person, provided to you by the Vanderbilt Alumni Association. Later this week, I will send a follow-up email with this archived link and a request for feedback, as well as any details for further um, events coming up. We are always looking to improve upon our offerings, so please be in touch and let us know how we can best support you. Thanks again, and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.